Right, uh, thanks very much. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be able to be here. I don't have any charts. I just got some notes for myself that I, I'm going to use. Um, just to start out, I'm thinking, you know, gee, 50 years, it's, uh, it's getting to be a while. Um, and even if you think about, you know, 15 years or so between the first and the last he's, he's launch and then 15 years that the, that the last one um, mm -hmm. worked, that meant that there's 30 years that, that there was actual um, real operations and data acquisition going on, which is a, an enormous uh, time and, and sort of what he's it meant to our collective uh, uh, discipline. Uh, it's important, I think, that, that we recognize that we've got both the individual spacecraft and the series aspect, because this is one of the things where, you know, the fact that there are multiple ones succeeding uh, themselves um, is, is really uh, big, and, and then really the series didn't stop with Nimbus. The series, or, or at least for, for most of the things, for a lot of the things, the series continued uh, in the future. So if I try to think about, all right, so what, what did it really do for us? So I was, I was trying to break this up into a couple of different um, categories. So the first is I'll say, well, everybody got the planned results. You know, there are things that people set out to do for specific reasons, and, and they worked. We got them. Um, we had a path to the future, um, both for, uh, for a little bit for research and for, for operations. So it becomes almost like a, a biblical chronology that you can think back for a lot of instrument streams, you know, limbs begat clays, which begat hurdles, SAMs begat ISAMs, leading to hurdles, you know, herb to herbs to series to RBI, TOMS to, well, TOMS and TOMS and OMI and NOMS. And there's a whole bunch of these things. There's so many of the data sets that we've all come to, uh, to know and, and, and love um, really got their start with the Nimbus series. And when people are looking at long-term Earth system evolution, um, in many cases, and creating, working with the multi-instrument, multi-platform data sets, that, that's the way that we have to address Earth system evolution because we rarely are in the position of having any one uh, data set long enough to say, well, we'll just look at evolution um, with one. We've got to put them together. Well, for a lot of those things, Nimbus is where it all started. You know, you look at a lot of those, those kind of the quintessential trends diagrams that you'll see. The left side of that is Nimbus. Um, and th there's some that transition to operations, so uh, that was uh, uh, always uh, as good as well because the transitioning things from research into operations uh, continues to be a challenge for, for the nation. Um, what are some other things it did? Well. Uh, you know, I was calling it unplanned results. Maybe it's not unplanned, but unanticipated results. Uh, things where, where the, the smart folks, many of them actually worked here, you know, looked inside the data and found things that were in the data that you know, maybe not weren't supposed to be there, but weren't supposed to be products. Uh, but people were really clever and figured out how to do that. Uh, and uh, I think Tom's, that you'll probably hear more about from Paul, um, it was a, a, a really good example. I'll try to say a little bit uh, more about that. Um, then you get some combined products where people would say, well, if I take this from the Nimbus sensor and this from something else, I can do something else. That's the, the, the real definition of, of synergy. Um, but, you know, two of the things that, that Nimbus really did for us, um, one is that, you know, if we talk about the kind of the discipline of Earth system science, but uh, as a discipline, it's really pretty new. Uh, before Nimbus, I think, you know, you'd have meteorology and oceanography and a bunch of other things, but people did their own thing. But I think it was really when Nimbus came along and, and you successively worked your way up to Nimbus 7, which was probably the, 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 the one that, that really came furthest along of that. That's what let people really look at different parts of the Earth system at the same time and begin to do the interdisciplinary work and look at how the different components of the Earth system relate to each other, and, and also to begin to sort of integrate cause and, and effect so that you had enough comprehensiveness of measurement that you could look at different parameters and, and how they would vary in time and space and test them against models and see whether the pictures that one had held together in the face of data that essentially were now comprehensive enough that you couldn't get the right answer for the wrong reason anymore. You know, you had to, you know, if you were getting it right, it had to be pretty much because it was right. Um, and that, those are the kinds of things that, that, that Nimbus let us 
uh, do. Uh, the other thing is, it let us do a lot of that in 3D. You know, I think it's, it's hard for many of us I think, to think back before that time, uh, where for a lot of things, especially like, say, for 3D atmospheric uh, uh, constituents, you know, we have some balloon, balloon profiles and some aircraft trajectories, but we really didn't have 3D climatologies, let alone over a period long enough that you could look at, you know, what happens from one season to the next, what happens from uh, 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 one year to the next. And, and those are some of the things uh, that we got. So uh, I don't want to say a lot about the details of, of many of the things because the speakers who are here after me are way more knowledgeable um, about those particular applications. Uh, so you know, I'll, I'll just maybe say a little bit about those instruments that you know, perhaps won't be um, represented by some of the people who are, who are here. Um, and uh, you know, I, I mentioned LIMS. Um, seven months of data, uh, but going from, I think, what, 84 north to 64 south, weather, uh, uh, ozone, uh, NO2, nitric acid, um, with uh, three-dimensional uh, distributions. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that uh, had temperature as well. So things that that let us do, and when you combine that with uh, the SBUV, uh, profiles and, and you know really said we had this three-dimensional distribution of ozone um, with a good spatial resolution working its way down into the uh, lower stratosphere and then with the NO2 and nitric acid being able to look at partitioning um, and, and, and be able to look at chemistry uh, at, at say a little bit more about some of the things that that meant. Um, you had SAMs with the uh, uh, methane and N2O profiles so that one would be able to get, get a sense of these uh, radiatively and chemically active source gases and the, the vertical rates of decay, which would provide some information about uh, photochemistry and the, the balance between chemistry and dynamics in ways that were very difficult to have addressed before without that kind of information. You had SAM2 with the polar stratospheric uh, uh, cloud measurements um, uh, and, uh, say, after the uh, ozone hole was uh, discovered and people were trying to figure out um, what was causing that. Having the distributions of polar stratospheric clouds from SAM2 became really important to providing information about the, the, the climatology of the, the particles that were the surfaces for the uh, heterogeneous chemistry. Um, and, and a lot of those, I guess, you know, and so I'm not going to say much about TOMS and SBUV, I figure Paul will cover that. Um, those were kind of the, the planned products. Uh, but then you also had the uh, you know, unanticipated ones, like the, um, say, TOMS aerosols and TOMS UV reflectivity. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, maybe they were planned all along, but, you know, they, they uh, or people thought of that or it started out like, you know, sometimes one person's noise is another person's signal and, you know, you start out trying, we've got to get rid of this stuff and then, no, wait, there's actually geophysical information in there and people figured it out. And when I asked around the headquarters uh, for, to, to some of my folks, as well as a few people in the field, um, what, what are some of the things that I sh should say? One, one, one of my uh, guys, David Considine, did a web of science run and said, okay, give me number seven in the top ten papers that um, relate to atmospheric science and meteorology. And I think the largest one by a factor of two was, I think, w one of the first Tom's absorbing aerosol climatology papers. You know, something that wasn't, you know, wasn't supposed to be there. Um, but people figured it out and went and did it. And, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, good stuff that came out of that because it was a unique product. Um, you had the surface UV and uh, say, you know, talked about Earth system science and, and 3D. Well, that also began to get us into applications. There's probably other ways that one could, could do. But, you know, once you started getting surface UV, people could work that into surface UV forecasts and actually begin to, to think about, you know, how people can use that information in, in ways that weren't anticipated. So. Um, uh, that, that's, uh, oh, and then combined products, um, the Tom's uh, Sage uh, residuals that people use to infer tropospheric uh, uh, ozone. Uh, and, and that became, uh, you know, people found that this bulge out over the tropical Atlantic and then began to investigate that. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that came out um, in different ways. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm personally grateful to the Nimbus series, uh, you know, for for my career. Um, I arrived at Goddard in, in December of 1983 um, to be the, the, uh, the, the chemist 
And the 3D stratospheric modeling grouper, as I like to say, are the right-hand side with all the dynamical terms on the left-hand side. So, you know, I used to say, yeah, call me P minus L. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I would say, and it was, you know, to initialize and evaluate the chemistry in a 3D model. So what did I do? I, you know, got ozone, NO2, nitric acid, water vapor from limbs, got the N2O and methane from SAMs, got the ozone from, you know, more ozone from SBUV. Um, I don't know how I would have started that work if it weren't for um, number seven. And for me, the timing was great because I think six months after I came to Goddard was when this really fat issue of JGR was published that had all the validation papers um, for number seven. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was one of the most used um, uh, journals. And, and again, you know, it's many of the people here and, and the predecessors were the ones who, who really made that work. Uh, and uh, the, uh, then, then when I decamped to headquarters to manage uh, the atmospheric chemistry modeling and analysis program, and I started getting proposals from people, well, you know, think about what are some of the earliest proposals that I remember getting? And this is 1990, so this is, you know, it was still flying, but it was more than a decade after launch. Well, one was we processed the LIMS data. LIMS was seven months of data, or six and a half or so, uh, but yet, you know, more than a decade after the data ended, uh, it was like, hey, we can reprocess this. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff, new spectroscopy, things that people learned. Also, the fact that, that the, uh, and this is something that's even hard for, for me to grasp, is they had to do a lot of this stuff with really kind of ancient computing. Um, so it was hard to process stuff. So one of the things that the LIMS folks said were, um, you know, we only processed, only used one-fifth of the data. We didn't have the computing cycles to use all the data. So now we can actually use all the data. So they went and did that. They reprocessed the LIMS data. I remember a proposal uh, to go back and uh, use, um, look at Nimbus 4 BUV data, because I think you know, the idea is that was uh, close to a decade before Nimbus 7. And if they could go back and clean up the Nimbus 4 data and make it as consistent as possible with the Nimbus 7 data, then you could start comparing you know, trying to compare things from the early 70s to the late 70s. Uh, I remember a proposal that came in to look at the SCR data, I think also from Nimbus 4. Um, and the idea there was it was, a, it was infrared. I, I mean, I'd never heard of SCR at the time. Um, but it, was a, it had the, the so I remember, the, it had the Chapri brand in it. And somebody said, let's go look over Antarctica. Because if maybe we can pull the Antarctic ozone out from the mid-70s, and get some information as to whether or not there was an ozone hole, um, you know, before the number seven data started. That one didn't work out, um, but it, you know, I think it showed the community really, you know, creatively looking to see what they could get out of the historical data. And now, when I say it didn't work out, I, sh I, I should be careful. They didn't get the ozone data, but I think they learned more about the infrared radiative transfer over Antarctica uh, than one ever knew before. And I think that became exceedingly useful. Uh, as one looked ahead. So that one may not have worked um, uh, uh, were quite the way um, uh, it, it was an anticipated, but I feel like, you know, it was a good investment. Um, and then there were the TOMS additional products, like the um, aerosols and um, uh, surface UV product. Um, and, uh, you know, that one, I, I feel, you know, maybe a slight degree of, you know, paternity because I, I was smart enough to say yes to the proposal. Frankly, I'm sure they would have done it anyway, you know, even if I hadn't, because it would have been the bootleg um, stuff, but I'm sure it, it made it much easier for the people to actually be able to say, yes, we got that funded. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm involved in the drug trade because, you know, say, I, you know, I, w I, I, was a, I was a Nimbus user and a Nimbus enabler. Um, uh, and, and uh, but uh, the, uh, in fact, you know, it's still there now. As, as I put the word out to some people and said, you know, what are some of the things that, that I could say? And one of the things that I got, um, you know, because it's, it's a wonderfully responsive community as well as, you know, um, uh, creative, uh, was a, a preprint, uh, or maybe it may actually be just a you know, manuscript copy of a paper that's either out or will soon be out in JGR, where people went back and assimilated limbs in SBUV into um, the, the uh, through GMAO into the GS5 model, and they actually looked at they're able to improve the quality of the assimilation uh, with the data. So now, 
you know, what, 25 years after the data are, w were taken for, for limbs, people are still working with it and finding that improves the quality of the science uh, that they can do today. So that's, that's uh, I think, a pretty phenomenal kind of thing in the testament to, to the work of everybody associated with it. So I guess I will, I will stop. Um, I would personally like to thank those who uh, made it happen. Uh, you know, these are wonderful legacy data sets as well as you know, pointing the pathway to the future uh, in so many ways. Um, I'd like to thank those who continue to, um, to exploit it uh, and the people who work with the, the, uh, the subsequent data sets because you know, answering these questions that we have about Earth system evolution, um, you know, we lie that we get the most out of all the data sets. So for those people who are doing that, um, uh, thank you, and uh, especially for, you know, really for all those who helped in, in, in doing this so that the Earth system science that we know is an integrated discipline can exist today. I don't know how that would have happened without Nimbus. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>